In this week's lecture, I want to discuss the importance of miracles, and the most important miracle, which of course to Christians is the resurrection. In the textbook, we've already looked at miracles and the various ways to define a miracle. I like what the textbook authors say, and I'm going to build off that. You notice that we use the word miracle in several ways, at least in English. So you might have heard of the Miracle Mets, the 1969 team that went from being the worst team in the um, in baseball to winning the World Series in one season. Nobody saw it coming. We use miracles, uh, the word miracle, in the context of sports all the time. Sometimes you see it used when events happen that you would never have thought possible outside of the realm of sports. So you might remember um, back in 2010 in the awful earthquake uh, that hit Haiti and killed over 100,000 people. We've actually discussed it in this class some. Well, one man, Evans Monsignac, was uh, buried for 27 days. Now, no scientist physician on earth would have told you that a man could have survived that long. Um, being buried in rubble, but he did. And so many people would call this a miracle. But what do we mean when we say, use the word miracle? C.S. Lewis defined it this way. He said, I use the word miracle to mean an interference with nature by a supernatural force. Now, this is slightly different than the dictionary or Webster's definition of miracle, which says a miracle is an event which apparently contradicts known scientific laws. Now, notice two things that are buried in this definition. First of all, it says apparently. And that's because uh, the dictionary itself is skeptical that anything could happen, So, uh, as far as miracle goes. So it would be apparent, even if it weren't in reality. The second thing is this scientific laws. Scientific law. Scientific law is assumed in the modern world. We've talked about this, the assumption that there are uh, laws that can never be violated, that they uh, determine everything uh, in, the, uh, in the sense that um, many of the uh, events that occur in this world are simply the result of the laws of nature. But we've also mentioned the fact that the Bible does not talk of laws of nature. And that entire understanding of the way the world is constructed is foreign to biblical or ancient thinking in general. So let's go back to C.S. Lewis's uh, definition just for a moment. He says, I use the word miracle to mean an interference with nature by a supernatural force. So he says with nature. He doesn't say um, contradicting scientific law. He just means that uh, in this physical world is an interference by supernatural force, by something outside of nature. Supernatural outside of nature. I like that definition better. But Webster's is much more influenced by the, sec uh, by the secular humanist definition of miracle. So if you're from a Church of Christ background, you might have heard some of our people define miracle in the very way that I'm about to show you. And I want to say that I disagree with classifying a miracle the way David Hume did. David Hume, of course, the um, 18th century um, philosopher, secular humanist philosopher. He wrote, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. So I've heard many preachers um, and uh, many apologists begin discussion of miracles by saying this very thing, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. We need to ask ourselves, where did we get this definition from? We did not get the definition of a miracle from, uh, as the violation of the laws of nature from the Bible. That comes from modernist thought, secular humanist modernist thought. And what David Hume argues is, Miracles of violation of the laws of nature. However, the laws of nature can't be violated. Therefore, no one has ever observed a miracle. There are things you can't explain. But that's different than a miracle. So he has already stacked the deck against the very notion that there can be miracles. And so what many Christian apologists will do today in an attempt to somehow protect the world from what they might see it as, see as a wild-eyed Pentecostalism, 
to say that the Holy Spirit doesn't do this anymore because we don't see any violation of the laws of nature. But that's not the way the Bible uh, defines a miracle at all. If we look for a definition of miracle in the Bible, you don't really get a definition. But what you do get are various words that are used to describe the things that Jesus and his disciples were able to do. So in Acts 2.22, it says that Jesus worked miracles, wonders, and signs. Now that word miracle in Greek is dunamis, same word we get our word dynamite from, or dynamic. It simply means the power or ability residing in a person or a thing. So uh, think of it as a power or a wonder, a terrace, something strange, something marvelous, something that catches your eye, or even a semeon, a sign. That's John's favorite word to describe what Jesus did. A sign or signal. What does the sign do? Well, a sign doesn't point to itself. A sign points to something else. And so biblically, the notion of a miracle is something that is eye-catching, something that shows great power, something that points to something else. Okay, that's the biblical notion of a miracle, and that's very different than a violation of the laws of nature. So if we try to think biblically, a miracle is simply something that we would look at and go, wow, that is incredible. I cannot believe that happened. That's much more in line with the biblical thought. Now, does that mean that everything we see and we say, wow, I believe, I can't believe that happened? Is a miracle? No, of course not. Because biblically, a miracle would be from the hand of God. Certainly there are things we see that we didn't expect. I reference in sports, we see that all the time. But um, when we look and we see things happen that are unexplainable, unexplainable, not just uh, improbable, but unexplainable um, by anything that we have, then there's a chance that uh, it is it fits the biblical definition of a miracle. So when we talk about Jesus and miracles, I'd say that there are four possibilities. The first one would be that he neither worked miracles nor claimed to work miracles. Now, of course, that's not what the Bible says about him. But there are those who would say, that the original Jesus, the one who lived and walked the earth, never claimed to be the Son of God, didn't work miracles. He was simply a, um, a radical preacher who called people to a certain kind of life, and that later on his followers built him up to be this divine character. And you see some of this in the Da Vinci Code kind of material. I'll talk about that later in the class, uh, but, but uh, I think it's safe to say that historically we don't see evidence of that that Jesus didn't work miracles, nor did he claim to work miracles. What you can say would be more likely is that he claimed to work miracles, but that he was a charlatan. In other words, that he said he could work miracles, but he couldn't. Third, it says he worked genuine miracles, but as a sorcerer by the power of Satan. This is the um, claim that Jesus' opponents would use. Not that he couldn't work miracles, but that he used the power of Satan to do it. Or, of course, the option that he worked genuine miracles and his claims about himself are validated by those miracles. So I've got here a list of six reasons to believe that Jesus worked miracles. We won't go into depth on all of them, but they will be available on the PDF that I'm going to provide on Blackboard to accompany the videos for today. So let's just quickly run through them. Jesus did most of his miracles publicly. Not all of them, but most of them. Even in front of his greatest skeptics, skeptics and harshest critics. So people who didn't want him to be able to do these things. Who wanted to invalidate him. He did them in front of those people. There were tens of thousands of eyewitnesses. This isn't some guy who's just in a little backwater and a few people heard about him and saw him. Number three, the apostles openly proclaimed that Jesus worked a great variety of miracles during the lifetime of those who could have refuted the claims. Remember this, the New Testament documents go back to the time of the apostles. So we don't uh, have to say that this was a legend built up over hundreds of years. Number four, both Roman and Jewish histories report at least the general fact that Jesus worked wonders. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Number five, Pharisees and rabbis did not deny miracles, but instead claimed Jesus did his Science by the power of demons. We mentioned that just a moment ago. Number six, those who recorded the miracles as eyewitnesses, the gospel writers except Luke, have every appearance of being credible. Okay? And, and that's going to be more of a, a subjective um, determination, but still I think it holds weight. 
So remember this when we jump into this discussion. The ancient world did not assume that there are some kind of laws of nature that can never be violated. That's the result of more modern scientific way of thinking. So what that means is most ancient people were open to the idea that miracles could be done, not miracles that violate laws of nature. Remember, they didn't think in those terms, but these wonderful signs that were somehow by the hand of God or of God's. So Josephus, who gives us an important uh, account of Jesus in his Antiquities of the Jews, writing sometime in the late first century, described Jesus. And what I give you here is not the uh, Testimonium Flavium that's often referred to uh, in literature, which is the quote quotation by Josephus about Jesus that has probably been doctored by Christians over the centuries. Um, if you just grab um, the works of Josephus off a shelf and read it, you're going to read that Josephus said that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's probably not what Josephus wrote. I hate to say that, but it um, is almost certainly not because Josephus was not a Christian. He was a Jew, but he was not a Christian. Um, so probably there were some Christian interpolations, some insertions in there by Christians over the centuries that, um, that uh, built Jesus up even more than Josephus uh, had written about him. So what this is is um, the best reconstruction we can make of what probably what Josephus really said. In other words, taking out some of the Christian interpolation. I have to preface it with that so that you'll understand why this doesn't look exactly like the um, Josephus quotation that you might have seen before. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. For the prophets of God had prophesied these and countless other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. Now we want to focus on the fact that Josephus said that Jesus worked surprising feats here. Okay, So we have this evidence outside of the Bible uh, by what we call an unsympathetic source, although it seems he did think highly of Jesus, he'd never met him, but had heard about him, that Jesus worked miracles. Then you get the Babylonian Talmud, which is the first or second century. It's difficult to date the uh, Talmud uh, with much precision. These are Jewish rabbinical traditions. Um, in this section of the Babylonian Sanhedrin, it says, on the eve of Passover, they hung Yeshu, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be um, Joshua, or uh, the Hebrew name for Jesus. And the crier went forth 40 days beforehand, declaring, Yeshu is going to be stoned for practicing witchcraft, for enticing and leading Israel astray. Anyone who knows something to be clear, uh, excuse me, to clear him, should come forth and exonerate him. But no one had anything exonerated for him, and they hung him on the eve of the Passover. So this has got some uh, elements that you don't see in the Gospels, that there, Jesus was um, publicly denounced as a heretic and that he, for 40 days, he said he was going to be killed. But what it does mention here, not on the crucifixion, but notice he was going to be stoned for practicing witchcraft. So again, you get this idea of Jesus performing these wonderful things that people couldn't explain. Um, you'll also see on the PDF I'm providing uh, at least six scriptural reasons why Jesus did miracles sometimes to provoke faith and sometimes to reward faith. It could also be to, because he had compassion, to fulfill prophecy, to create faith in people, and of course, um, because his mother asked him to, as she did in John chapter 2. This is the sign that Jesus is the Messiah. The lame walk, the blind receive sight, and those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear and the dead are raised. The good news is preached to the poor. This is the sign of the inbreaking of the kingdom of the Messiah. So we'll cover that in the next video.